Thank you so much, and thank you for coming for this session just after lunch. It's good to welcome you. My name's Gary Bishop, and just shortly, uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago, a friend of mine who'd had a long and wretched battle with heroin addiction um, was being discharged from prison, and um, as is, I think, more commonly than we'd like to expect the case, um, had nowhere to live. And three weeks later, he was found dead in a bed and breakfast about 100 yards from where I lived. At the time, I had no uh, understanding or knowledge of homelessness, really. Um, no, certainly no understanding of hidden homelessness and those kind of things. But um, to cut a very long story short, we ended up, my wife, myself, my, uh, some friends of ours, started a charity called Just Life, which exists now to help people to make their stay in unsupported temporary accommodation as short safe and healthy as possible. And so that's us, that's Just Life Foundation. We exist to support people who are close to the streets and our vision is to ensure their stay is short, safe and healthy as possible. As I said, just catch up with the slides. Um, this is a bit clunky. We're doing that because we know that every day thousands of people living in unsupported temporary accommodation suffer. They suffer with deteriorating mental health, deteriorating physical health, become victims of crime, lose control of their life and drop off the bottom rung of the housing ladder or die prematurely. I'm sure all of those who work here, who work in, in and alongside homeless services, homeless people, will recognise this picture that I'm beginning to paint of temporary accommodation. We're not talking about hostels, we're not talking about rough sleepers, we're talking about that kind of gap in between. Um, a definition that we've come up with through our research and our, our work over the last 10 years is this. Unsupported temporary accommodation is accommodation in which residents have no permanent resident status and limited access to local authority support to secure settled accommodation. It is popularly known as B&Bs, private guest houses, short stay HMOs, private hostels or emergency accommodation. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with that kind of world. We're going to cover some ground pretty quickly, as you've been, uh, been informed um, today. We want to cover these four points, um, Krista and myself. Um, and the first is that unsupported temporary accommodation is still largely unknown. It has a huge impact on health and well-being. More people are living like this than we realise. And we're going to cover some of the complexity of the current climate. We're going to move quite quickly, so stay with us. Um, we will try and cover the ground. This is Krista, who I'm so glad is here. Um, <laughs> as you can see, she's 34 weeks uh, pregnant, um, but she's wonderful. She's our uh, head of research and policy, and um, she's going to lead us through the next part. So I'm just going to talk real quickly about um, why UTA is still large, sorry, unsupported temporary accommodation is still largely unknown. And that's partly because there's lots of questions around unsupported temporary accommodation. Is it part of the private rented sector? We have a lot of people asking us that because if sometimes the local authority uses it, does that mean it's part of the private rented sector even if private landlords are running it? Is it part of homelessness provision? Sometimes we use this accommodation uh, or individuals use this accommodation or, uh, as a, to alleviate their homelessness, not as part of a statutory duty. So if people end up in this housing and they've not gone through the system, is it homelessness provision? Is it both or is it neither? <clears throat> so we, we believe that it is very much part of homelessness, and I'm just going to go th skip through some of this really quickly. But basically, we've developed, we, we believe it is part of homeless because in the Housing Act of 1996, it basically states that simply having a accommodation available for occupation does not ensure the safety and security that everyone should have a right to. So therefore, you can have a roof over your head but still be considered homeless. Again, this is just our definition um, that Gary just mentioned. But because it, this type of accommodation can sometimes cover the places where people end up in because they've been placed for, by, because they're owed a statutory duty, but also sometimes placed through adult social care or other avenues, which means that they aren't really um, recorded, they are still widely unknown and unacknowledged within the system, which means that it's much more difficult to get people to take the type of individuals living in this housing seriously. We have some challenges uh, that, come, uh, that we come across but we'll try to move this from being unknown to known. One of them is that um, this narrative around homelessness is rough sleeping. So you hear a lot about homelessness in the news and, and then when you read on, often that means rough sleeping and not just that. But whereas there's a whole lot of people who are living hidden and homeless in accommodation, both ones that we know about and ones that we don't know about. So this is the narrative that it's hard for us to move beyond. There's an element of shame in that um, 
either local authorities know that it exists, but they don't want to address it. If, if it's not the ones that they use, other local authorities might use it um, if it's in their borough. It's kind of like, we, we know that this is a problem, but we don't want to pay attention to it because we don't have the time. Um, but also because we know that it's quite bad, and so then it's easier to not think about it. Resources, though, as well. Re there's not, uh, when we talk about this, a lot of people think that we're trying to divert resources from rough sleeping or other initiatives, and that's not part of it. We're just trying to help create a better picture of what homelessness looks like in our society and within our systems. So um, we're going to show a quick video, or well, quick video, a few minutes video, um, that talks about the impact of health and well-being, the impact on health and well-being of people who live in this accommodation. Based off shop, long work, very simple. Whatever you do, do not get me grand more. Get some more work. I've got you some work away, but you ain't gonna like it. I do. And I went to her. Don't dare say it's grand more. She went, that's the only place I can get you. Your shelter put us there in this accommodation. My base officer sent me there, and I, I, I didn't want to go in. Bed was. Blood. I've seen a little bit of blood on uh, matches, and I said, "That's disgusting." I said, "I'm not. I'm, in my mind, I'm not living there." Then I went. I have to go to prison for a month. Back in prison, and I said, "Right, I'll do that." I said, "I'm not living there. I'll do prison for a month." We thought it was good at first. We got on well with who does it. We got on well with him, but then he started started arguing me out with him. The conditions of the place. It's not even changed from when I was there over 30 odd years ago. It's so same colours, same conditions. We went there, I think the bike runner was 19 years of age. It's disgusting. It's like the end of the road, the room stinks of urine. Some of the rooms stink of the uh, excrement. It's absolutely disgusting place to go. One time when I first moved on there, it was mostly alcoholics and drug addicts, and it was bedlam. Absolute murder. But they eventually, gradually, quietened it down. They charge them for food. Uh, you know, they charge them. If you're on GSA, you pay £30 a week. And if you're on ESA, you pay £50 a week. Just for a, a scabby breakfast and a tea, what's cooked in the morning and left on the dining table all day, with nothing covered in it. There's loads of different types of people there. There's drinkers. Heroin users, crack cocaine users, and they have a lot of uh, mental health people there. Uh, I think they just throw them in these places and, you know, just leave them there. You can't do what you want. He tells you what to do and everything. Go on, Steve, then. The showers hopeless. The showers are hopeless. He tells you when go for a shower and all this, like, he's telling me what to do. Not very warm in the bedroom. We'll turn the eating up. We'll turn the eating up at all. We can't report them because Johnson don't yeah, say kick us out. He'll kick us out, he said, if we report anything. We don't say anything. Worse than being on the streets, this is yeah. where we are now. Took the medication, woke up, next to it, I've got junkies sat on the side of it, syringing itself. I went, yeah, get off the bed, got my gear, and just walked straight out of that door. As soon as I woke up, supposed to be t temporary accommodations, but I was there for over two years, I was there. That's how long it's took me to get me the accommodations I've got. I think a lot of people are trapped because they're not getting the help they really need. I mean, do you think it's okay for people to live like no, that? No, 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 no. You've got to have at least a what? Yeah, I've lived on Grandsmore 36 years. To me, it's a roof over my head. It's better than sleeping on the streets. The landlord, I have a laugh with him. I have a real laugh with him because I've, I've known him since 1980. Over the years I've been on Grandsmoor, I've seen a lot come out in body bags, but they've been natural causes. One or two have been like suicides, and I've seen a lot come out. I've been there the longest, aye? There's uh, another bloke there, who's a caretaker manager, he's been there nine, ten years now. The end of the road. There's only two places you're going to go from Grandsmoor, it's either to prison or to the grave. I was really gratified due to Nigel and just like themselves. They got me out of there. They got me a nice little flat, uh, all levels, walking shower and everything. Some will move on, some will get thrown out. If you're a troublemaker, you will be thrown out. 
Oh, if you don't pay your rent, it's the way you take Gransmore. It's the way you look at it. If you think you can live there and be okay there, live there. If you can't, find somewhere else to live. We can't make it better, us, can we? Why no. not? Because we can't. We can, can, can just sit here and tell people your story. But is it, people with power need to change it, not people with the voice. People with the power. It's a powerful um, film, that, isn't it? Just to get a little insight into um, into the world that people are living in. Actually, it's not a while since I've seen that film. Two of those, at least two of the people in it, have died since. And the gentleman who said he'd lived there for 30 years spent his entire life coming out of care and lived his entire life there till he moved out five, four or five weeks before he died. And um, so there's, there's, that's an insight into the way that people's um, health is being impacted. We've done a, a five-year longitudinal study of people living in temporary accommodation, unsupported temporary accommodation. We found that 68% um, said they're waiting for further housing, 80% said, said that their mental health had deteriorated, 80% said they had a poor diet and so on and so forth. We're finding circumstances which are damp, where people have no locks on their doors, where they're exposed to all kinds of intimidation and bullying from other residents um, and uh, even from landlords at times. Um, and so the, the, the conditions are, are really, really poor. I just want to give you a very quick couple of stories from this week. So yesterday I was sitting in our office listening to one of our health engagement workers wrestling with the fact that on the phone um, with the authorities to say and she kept saying but he is stuck in his room and she kept repeating this to the authorities he is stuck you don't understand he is stuck in his room and so when she came off the phone I said, what, Ella what are you talking about to this this person and she said we've just brought this man out of um, out of prison we've known he's coming out for eight months we've been working with housing and all the other uh, services to get him a proper care package and proper housing. They have placed him on the third floor. He can't move. He, he is stuck, physically stuck in his room. He cannot get out to use the loo. He is using a saucepan as a toilet by the bed. It is, it's full of poo and wee and cigarette butts and phlegm. If the place catches fire, she said, he will burn to death. He is literally stuck in his room. And I said, well, what have we done? We've raised the safeguarding alert last week. We've gone to the multi-agency homeless health um, meeting which, and there's been um, no, no action from there. The, the serious risk management team that exists in that local authority cannot get him on the agenda until April. He is stuck in his room. And these are the, this is a, a placement by the local authority, by the way, into accommodation which is commissioned and paid for by the local authority. And that I could have that's just from yesterday. I could have told you, if we'd had time, I could have told you many, many stories about the impact of this type of accommodation on people's health and well-being, the increasing drug use, increasing alcohol consumption, which, to be fair, you know, you can imagine why all of that happens and comes into play in the kind of conditions that we're asking people to live in. So when we, were, when we started uncovering this about how it affected people's health and well-being and that this, this type of accommodation typically fell through the gaps, we started thinking how many people in, in, our, in England are actually living like this? Um, so we started doing some research uh, by sending freedom of information requests to all 326 local authorities in England to start asking them how many people live in bed and breakfasts in your accommodate or in your um, local area? How many live in bed and breakfasts that were placed by the local authority, but also who are claiming housing benefit who were not placed by the local authority? Because we do know there are people living in that insecure accommodation, unsupported temporary accommodation, who find their way not through um, local authorities' uh, placements. Now I'm going to skip through some of this. So we use bed and breakfast as a proxy. Because 1996, there was a, sh there was a shelter report that came out that did the same thing, but looked at England and Wales. Official B&B population at that time was 7,660. After their count, the estimate of actual numbers was 72,550. So we were wondering, is there a similar story today? Um, so our research is up to 2015-16, and I'm just gonna skip through till it shows you what our figures showed. So if you look at the one that's the furthest on the right, are most, that's for 2015 and 16, and the average quarterly placement into B&Bs from, from the government at that time was 5,870, but our estimates show there's about 51,500 households still living in B&Bs, and that's households, that's not individuals. 
Um, we estimate because, again, in our definition, we said private guest houses, HMOs, that sort of thing, there could be an additional 25,000 that we just don't know about because it's hard to quantify if it covers so many different types of places. Um, we have updated figures, not 1717, but they're 1718. They'll be available in the coming weeks. But what I can say is that the figure that we have estimated in, in the, the last figure we've estimated is 56,600 households. So the number has gone up. So we come to the complexities of our current um, circumstances. The first one, which you'll all be familiar with, universal credit, delays in payments, reduction in payments, which is making people feel insecure because their rent is not being paid. It's making landlords feel insecure. And there's a reduction, actually because of that, partly because of that, there's a reduction in bed spaces available to councils and local authorities because landlords don't want to open them up to universal credit recipients because they're uncertain about how the payments are going to be made. Um, and that is impacting on the local authority landlord relationships because local authorities are so desperate to get hold of properties and rooms and facilities that they're unwilling to hold landlords to account on various issues to do with conditions or management or the way things are being run or to act on complaints because of fear of losing the accommodation that they ha currently have. We're seeing that in a number of cities across the country where uh, landlords are just vacating the space because they can, they can find easier money elsewhere, more secure income. And as we know, the lack of affordable housing across the country is sort of underpinning all of the discussion we're having throughout these two days. There's a severe lack of services, so we um, often uh, are, are privileged to sort of share our bit of research and our story and our experiences at events like this, and we often say we've found hardly any services that are directly commissioned to people um, in, um, in unsupported temporary accommodation. Bearing in mind that the statistics Krista's just put before you mean that the by far, by far the biggest number of homeless people in the UK live in unsupported temporary accommodation, by far. There's loads more of them than there are rough sleeping, and there's loads more of them than there are in hostels. Um, and that, that brings us to the last point of the complexity. What we're finding is people, with people who have um, very complex health needs, they present to a hostel, which is a well-managed hostel run, say, by the local authority or run by the YMCA or one of those great organisations that we, perhaps some of you represent who run brilliant hostels with security and the key work and lovely conditions and, and all of those kind of things. And they go there and the hostel will say to them, I'm sorry, we don't have the expertise to deal with your particular problem, your particular mental health problem, your particular physical health problem, your addiction, whatever it is. And so where do they go? Because there's not the expertise in the hostels, they go back into the unsupported temporary accommodation where there is nothing, no support whatsoever, apart from maybe a, a caretaker landlord who is probably a resident of that facility as well. And so we've got a number of complexities around at the moment and very little at this stage being done to address those. Um, uh, if, you, if you have initiatives in your local area and so on or learning, we would love, love to hear from you um, uh, to, to add into the work that we're trying to do. We're just going to conclude real quickly. Again, the things that we've just gone over is that this is largely unknown. It impacts people's health and well-being. There are more people living there than we know, and there's so much complexity around it, which makes it a challenge for us to do, to do um, much. But we are trying to do something to create change. So one of the things we're calling for is that for this to be acknowledged as part of homelessness in the UK. So very much so it is if you're in a B&B or a temporary accommodation that the council has used, but there are places where the council hasn't used, where again, the whole question of PRS, temporary accommodation, comes into account, not acknowledged as part of homelessness. We would like it to see it be acknowledged as part of homelessness. The last thing is that we are looking to create a collaborative <laughs> network of um, local, what we call temporary accommodation action groups that will drive national change through collective action. What that looks like is local place-based groups that are not driven, not um, led by us in local areas. We do one in Manchester and Brighton, which are led by us, and one in Hackney in, here in London. But um, very much to support local areas to gather stakeholders around the table and say, what can we do to create change with this? Um, starting from a point of, not of blame, but saying we recognize how bad this is for residents. And these groups, importantly, need to include residents and landlords as well. 
um, and which we do in other parts of the country. And what we're seeing is we're seeing that there are changes we can make locally, even though we know we need more housing, we know we need more support. There are changes we can do locally if we collectively work together um, that will improve people's experiences of the accommodation. Um, so we're looking to set those up around, around the country to build on some of the sex successes we've seen so far. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, both. <laughs> So um, what's really fascinating about this is that in the UK we certainly have a long tradition of talking about the hidden homeless and, and we do know that rough sleeping is just the tip of the iceberg and yet the, despite um, the knowledge we have around prevalence, even if it's not particularly accurate, it does feel as if we have good enough knowledge. But change has been really slow, so what's really interesting is how you're trying to look at this from a different perspective, I guess. So um, I wonder how you're going to ensure that is the network that you're developing, um, what will be the role of ensuring that they're drawing on evidence and data, but focus not just on the prevalence, but how we can be, make better use of, of local stock as well, which seems to be where things often go wrong. But let's take a couple of questions from the floor as well, because we're, time is very short. No one? There must be some questions. <laughs> yep. <laughs> can you say who you are? Yeah, um, so my name is Sarah Sweeney. I work at Friends, Families and Travellers. Uh, so we work with Gypsy Women and Traveller Communities. So I was quite interested to hear what you have to say because you see a lot of overlaps between, so there's about 3,000 traveller caravans on unauthorised um, land and those right. people then basically have some of the sim similar issues. I, w I wonder how you think then we can work alongside each other, um, rough sleeping, um, unsupported temporary accommodation, gypsies and travellers living on unauthorised land. W where, is this, where is this space there for collaboration? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely space for collaboration because I think part of, I think the solutions that we need to create change within our system um, need to come from us acknowledging where all the problems in the system are and, and when we just have a one way of looking at things and I don't think we're going to really solve it. So I guess part of it would be around like bringing together those conversations um, because where we've found that um, where we can start creating change is when you bring disparate sectors and stakeholders together, where they kind of come together, where those initiatives and, and where those sectors come together is where some of that change ends up being able to happen. But it's through listening and hearing and, and, and um, building relationships with people who think differently and work differently. So I think it, it would be around how do we come together, listen to each other and think where are the mechanisms between the gaps or that, that we can do to fill the gaps to really support is basically collaboration, trust, building relationships and being able to do that to them say, these are the changes we need to make. Would you like to conclude with a comment about you know, the network and how it might? Um... Well, just that we've seen some amazing things happen. So we've been running temporary accommodation action groups in uh, Manchester for two years, maybe a bit over two years, Brighton for about 18 months, Hackney for about a year, getting on for a year. And just some really uh, significant changes, small but significant changes, things like writing an evictions policy, rewriting the evictions policy, for example, which sounds a bit negative, doesn't it? But also actually making sure that certain groups don't get referred to certain places and these kind of things. But our, ho our hope is, that, so there are some lots and lots of quick win stories like that, but our hope is that more strategic change will come over time. But as Chris said, it's about building trust, collaboration across the, the piece and bringing the right people to the table and, um, and holding that space in a safe way, because I think we've got landlords, residents, um, statutory services, emergency services, all kinds there, which could be like a bit of a powder keg because it can get into a bit of a finger wagging. You have to set the ground rules pretty clearly from the start. So we're, we're not about the past or we're about, we're about tomorrow, not about you know what's gone before. So um, we're trying to hold that. So, yeah. Right, so we'll move on, but let's thank them one more thank time. You.